I turn to John. And Thank don't you. be surprised if we address many different problems. Yes. The idea yes. of this seminar yes. traditionally is that we address a lot of problems and then we uh, discover, of course, that we miss two or three that are also important, but it should come from the audience. John, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, and our chairman instructed us to focus on narrowly rather than uh, across the board. Uh, <clears throat> I've been uh, thought I would talk a little bit about what's happening with trade. And uh, as, uh, as I said yesterday in the plenary session, uh, what's particularly notable is from 1950 to 2008, essentially, trade grew faster than the global economy. In other words, trade, as was intended by the architects of the post-war uh, international system, that it would facilitate trade, and trade would be uh, a drive, a key driver of global of the global expansion. Since 2012, essentially since the fading of COVID, we now have had a decade in which eight out of ten years, trade has grown more slowly than uh, the overall economy, and the expectation is that this could well continue uh, going forward. Now there are some. Uh, obvious reasons why this might be happening. Uh, there's been post-COVID relatively slow growth in general, and uh, that has meant slower in private incomes, uh, slower growth in private income, and in a context of slower population growth in many countries. But it has given rise to discussion of deglobalization, fragmentation, etc. And uh, this has been accompanied, these uh, concerns have been accompanied by a dramatic deterioration in the operations of the World Trade Organization. In 2008, one of the key priorities of the, G, of the first G20 Leaders Summit was to prevent new trade restrictions and to promote the adoption of new liberalization, specifically the adoption of the WTO's Doha Development Round. Well, the opposite has happened. A lot of new protectionist measures have been adopted, and the Doha ground has been completely abandoned. And in the meantime, as is well known, the WTO's dispute resolution mechanism has fallen into disuse and disrepair, and um, <laughs> symbolizing a deterioration in the trading system. But it's probably worth thinking a little more broadly about what is the underlying uh, aspects of this uh, change. Let's think about before, in the post-World War II orders, trade was driven by gains in cost and efficiency. Uh, essentially, it was obvious economic incentives that drove trade through the opening, the reduction in restrictions, lowering of tariffs, et cetera but the focus was, a net, was essentially economic. And in fact, uh, a high point, I think, in the considering that many of us came from used to a world in which import substitution was considered a, a viable means of development, I can recall the Commission on Growth and Development uh, that was uh, operated by the World Bank, established by the World Bank and chaired by Mike Spence, a Nobel laureate, that concluded that there was no, no case of uh, sustained rapid development of emerging developing economies that did not involve an opening of economies to the world markets rather than the opposite. But it seems to me that what is happening is there has been a shift in uh, considerations not to abandon, not that there's been an abandonment of the idea of we're pursuing economic efficiency, but there are new considerations that have been taken into, are being taken into account and taken seriously. And they, I think, can be lumped under the rubric security. Security about energy supply, security about food and health, security about even technology. And uh, as a friend of mine, Marsha Vandenberg says, uh, this is really driven by three C's, she puts it. First C is conflict, uh, Ukraine and U.S.-China tension. Second, COVID, that brought about a new realization about potential 
uh, issue of issues of resilience of supply chains and the danger of uh, relying on foreign uh, on foreign trade and uh, avoiding bottlenecks. Third C is climate and the uh, clear need for international cooperation, but also the possibility that uh, uh, climate oriented measures like a uh, border adjustments uh, for carbon tax could create new barriers to trade. And then finally, as we've talked about today, in tech and technology uh, and the source of proliferation of both new forms of subsidies as well as new forms of trade restrictions. Uh, and as we've heard this morning, subsidies in this area are becoming so ubiquitous that they're virtually meaningless. Since everybody's subsidies, subsidized, nobody has any particular national advantage. And then finally, uh, the new need, to, uh, the new uh, uh, as allied aspect of trade in data and the concern about data uh, security and uh, the worry about cross-border data access. Now we can see part of this in a reallocation of trade. You might call it trade diversion, but certainly we're seeing the growth of manufactured uh, exports from Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, India, and in the United States, especially Mexico, as some recent research has shown that in many cases, these uh, the businesses that are expanding trade in these, let's call them more uh, frontier markets is probably the wrong word, but uh, newly expanding markets may actually represent investment of former, uh, of firms that formerly uh, located those, uh, uh, those activities in China. So where are we headed? Well, the G20, uh, the recent G20 leaders the summit had a new uh, 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 section on trade. And it said that, but well, here's what it's looking for. Here's what the G20 are committed to. A system that is rules-based, rules non-discriminatory, fair, open, inclusive, equitable, sustainable, and transparent with the WTO at its core. What are the measures that they agreed to do this, to accomplish this? First, they said resurrect the, dis the uh, dispute settlement system by next year. Good luck with that. That they will promote in exports from micro and small and medium enterprises that they support the G20 generic framework for mapping global value chains, that they will continue work on the high-level principles on the digitization of trade documents, and they will support the WTO's aid for trade. Doesn't sound like a very uh, active uh, agenda for turning around trade. Uh, my conclusion is that these three C's, uh, conflict, COVID, climate, and T, technology, are going to have an impact, and it's going to be a while and before we can start to resurrect a, a trading system that is consistent with the goals announced by the WTO, uh, excuse me, by the, by the G20. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you are <laughs> killing one of my, my very small list of positives. Because I, I, I would say, despite the geostrategic tensions, uh, despite the quarrels and the wars, uh, we had a communique of the G20. The full body of the international community signed it. The triumph of the Indian uh, in you know, managing that to get that uh, communique has been quite remarkable. And, uh, also in our domain, the pure financial domain, the system of the Basel committees, the Financial Stability Board, reporting to the G20 continues to function. So, so we, we have there something which is perhaps uh, miraculous, but, but continues to go, and we will see. 
Jean your skepticism I, is perfectly justified. <laughs> I was focused just on trade. I didn't <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You're right. You're right. And on, on, tra on trade, uh, we, we are very likely, of course, to be disappointed. That, that's absolutely clear.